Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Hi, guys. It's been so long. I'm really happy to be recording today. However, I won't be able to edit this and polish it, so you're going to hear my breasts. Hopefully, it won't be too annoying, but I'm on a tight deadline because I have to take care of my dad today. I've kind of become a caretaker to him in the last two to three weeks, so that's where I'm at. If you're new here, welcome. This is a channel where you get true crime in a concise manner with the facts, but we also do speculate. Now, without further ado, let's get started. It was a crime that shocked a small, close-knit community to its core. Eight members of one family, done in as they slept in bed in their homes. As shocking as the crime was, so was it complex. The victims were discovered deceased in four different homes. Well, actually, three were trailer homes and one was a camper. Thus, there were four crime scenes. All of the victims had wounds to the head from a weapon that goes boom, 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 and there were multiple wounds on each one. Whoever did this made sure no one lived to tell. All but one of the victims were adults. The youngest was 16 years old and a male. Three young children ages four days old, six months old, and three years old, respectively, were spared. Although they were not spared, the horror of the events imprinted somewhere deep in their psyches. The three kids were found near their deceased parents, and all were coated in the red stuff that runs through our veins. To investigators, that the children were allowed to live seemed to be an important clue. The perpetrators seemed to have a soft spot for little ones. Surprisingly, no fingerprints or DNA from the perpetrator was found. The only clues were two left shoe prints from differently sized but identical tennis shoes. The prints were tattooed in red on the floor of Chris Roden Sr.'s trailer. One shoe was size 10 and a half, the other size 11. Experts also said that the treads on the shoes, on the soles, indicated that they were new. This would seem to say that someone had purchased them specifically for the crime. Three different weapons were used as well. A Walther Colt 1911 22 caliber, a Glock, and an SKS rifle. This seemed to spell three perpetrators. Clearly, whoever committed these acts had planned them and was intent on destroying this branch of this family. The greatest mysteries of the case were who done it and why, and the answers turned out to be as shocking as the crime. For this bed crime story, we need to travel back to Pike County, Ohio in 2016. Now, Pike County is in a region of the United States known as Appalachia. It spans many states that follow the spine of the Appalachian Mountains. It's a place where many folks struggle to make a living, and many live in hollers. There, calling oneself a hillbilly is acceptable. In this part of Appalachia, the same families tend to remain over generations. The people are deeply religious and often trusting of their neighbors. They'll also give you the shirt off their back, even if you're a stranger, which makes this brutal mass crime all the more unbelievable. This is not a place where stuff like this is supposed to happen. It was the biggest mass crime ever to occur in Ohio, and it's the type of shocking event that will never be forgotten. We have to also go back to April of 2016, the Rodins are a well-liked family known for their generosity and bubbly personalities, 
40-year-old Chris Roden Sr. is the patriarch. Chris Sr. lives in a trailer with his 38-year-old cousin, Gary Roden. 37-year-old Dana Manley Roden is Chris's ex-wife. Their three children are 20-year-old Clarence Roden, who goes by Frankie. Frankie lives with his fiancée, Hannah Mae Gilly, and their two children in a trailer. Next comes 19-year-old Hannah Roden, who has a two-year-old daughter and a four-day-old baby. And finally, Chris Roden Jr., who's just 16 years old. Both Chris Jr. and Hannah Roden and her two young children live with their mother, Dana Roden. Finally, there's 44-year-old Kenneth Roden, who's Chris Roden Sr.'s brother. He lives in his own residence nearby. They all went to sleep on the night of April 21st, warm, cozy, and tucked in their beds, but none of them would live to see the dawn. Here's how things unfolded after the crime. Later, we'll talk about who committed the crime and how it unfolded. Bobby Jo Manley, Dana Roden's sister, heads to Chris Roden Sr.'s property on the morning of April 22nd. She's there to tend to his dogs and chickens as she does every day. It sounds like this was Bobby Joe's paid position. Bobby Joe's surprised to find the front door to the trailer locked. Chris Sr. never locks it, but Bobby Joe has a key. Once inside, Bobby Joe sees that something horrible has happened. The floors are awash in swirls of red. She sees Chris Sr. lifeless on the floor. His cousin, Gary Roden, is nearby, and he too is lifeless. It looks as if someone took fists to each man. Bobby Joe grabs her phone with trembling hands and dials 911. The dispatcher tells Bobby Joe to get out of the trailer. Bobby Joe then heads over to an adjacent trailer where Chris Sr.'s son, Frankie, lives with his fiancée, Hannah Mae Gilly, and their two children. Bobby Joe is one brave woman. I would be running for my car, locking the door, and burning rubber to get away from this property of horrors. But I'm a wimp, and I'd be afraid whoever did this was still lurking about. Frankie Roden and Hannah Mae Gilly have a six-month-old baby, and Frankie also has a three-year-old son named Brentley from another woman. Both kids are with Frankie and Hannah Mae in the trailer. When Bobby Joe knocks on the door, three-year-old Brentley answers. Bobby Joe asks him where Daddy is. The child replies that Daddy is playing zombie in the bedroom. Can you believe it? If a three-year-old just said that to me after I'd just come from a horror show at the other trailer, I would have grabbed that kid and again torn away from the property, which has turned into a ghost town. How a three-year-old knows about zombies, well, that's another story. Steadfast, Bobby Joe enters Frankie's trailer and heads down the hall. She finds Frankie and Hannah Mae Gilly lifeless in bed with their six-month-old baby wriggling between them. The baby is smeared in red. It's the stuff of a Hollywood horror movie. Bobby Joe must have called her older brother, James, and asked him to go to Dana Roden's house because James found the bodies of Dana and her two youngest children, Hannah Roden and Chris Roden Jr. Dana is dead in bed with four wounds to her head. Chris Jr. is also lifeless in his bed. He too has four wounds to the head. Hannah Roden is found deceased with two wounds to her head and her four-day-old baby, whose father is Charlie Gilly, 
is next to her alive, but again awash in red. Hannah's other child, a two-year-old daughter named Sophia, that she shares with her ex-boyfriend Jack Wagner, is safe because Sophia just happened to be staying with her father on the night of the crime. In a second 911 call, recorded later that day at 1.26 p.m., a cousin of Kenneth Roden's named Donald Stone tells the dispatcher that Kenneth is dead with a wound smack in the right eye. And oddly enough, dollar bills are scattered over Kenneth's body like large shards of green confetti. What's that about? Was someone trying to send a message? Kenneth was the last body to be discovered. He is victim number eight. By the way, all the victims had been done in at point-blank range, with the barrel either touching their skin or just centimeters away. Eight people dead in Pike County, Ohio, and one branch of the Roden family completely wiped out overnight. Once the town learns of the carnage, it goes into terror mode. Who's going to be next? And the perpetrators are still out there somewhere. Suddenly, the town has eight funerals to attend. The victims are all in open caskets. You heard that right. Open caskets. Who would have open caskets when all the victims were wounded in the head? I'm going to guess and say that the remaining rodents wanted everyone to see what these monsters had done to their loved ones. Three trailers and one camper, the homes in which the deceased rodent family members died, are boarded up and towed to a storage area. They will later be moved to yet another storage area, causing anyone who knows about how important it is to preserve evidence and for investigators to maintain the chain of custody to shudder. Without any eyewitnesses, any DNA evidence, and any fingerprints, the cops have little to work with. Just those shoe prints and the three types of weapons used as determined from shell casings left at the crime scenes and bullets found in the victims. The weapons themselves are nowhere to be seen. While searching the Roden family properties, the cops find three large and sophisticated marijuana grow operations, and this is when it wasn't legal to do such a thing. This leads investigators to initially wonder whether the crimes were drug-motivated or connected to rival drug cartels in the area. Apparently, there are Mexican cartels that operate in this part of Appalachia. Later, however, the cops changed their minds. They realized that whoever committed the crimes had to be local and well acquainted with the rodents' various properties and their layouts. A stranger would not have known where each of the rodents lived and slept. At this point, the cops begin to focus in on Hannah Roden's ex-boyfriend, Jake Wagner. Jake Wagner and Hannah Roden were involved in a nasty custody dispute at the time of Hannah's death. Perhaps that played a role in the crime. The authorities take away trailers belonging to Jake's family as well to process them. Jake and Hannah dated for two years before Hannah moved in with Jake and his parents, Billy and Angela Wagner, and Jake's older brother, George Wagner. Hannah would later break up with Jake and move out. Sometime after the breakup, the custody dispute arose. Let's stop for a second so that I can tell you who the Wagners are to avoid any confusion. They are composed of Jake, whose full name is actually Edward Jake Wagner, but he goes by Jake, Jake's father, Billy, Jake's mother, Angela, and Jake's older brother, George. Billy Wagner comes from a wealthy family. His mother, Frederica, is the one with the big bucks. She and her husband had a horse breeding business that was very successful. Frederica owns the Flying W Farm in Pike County and Frederica's net worth is believed to be around $4 million. 
which is like a billion dollars in Appalachia. So the Wagners are the closest thing to blue bloods or the Kardashians, so to speak, in Pike County. And many believe that one of the reasons Angela married Billy Wagner is because he came from money. Billy, you see, wasn't known for being super swift in the head, if you know what I mean, and he wasn't what you'd call easy on the eyes either, at least by most people's standards. His sartorial preferences are tank tops that good old boys with beer guts wear. You can picture that. Baggy dad jeans slung low enough to reveal a mighty crack, and it's not a crack in the foundation. Ugh, yuck. Back to Billy's son, Jack Wagner, and Jake's ex-baby mama, Hannah Roden. They began dating when Hannah was just 13 and Jake was 18. Now, this kind of thing is acceptable, apparently, in this part of Appalachia. Hannah gets pregnant at age 15, and by then, Jake is 20. At some point, Jake and Hannah get engaged, and they even have rings tattooed on their fingers. Jake's mother, Angela, seemed to adore Hannah Roden like a daughter, at least in the beginning. So everything was hunky-dory for a while, but eventually Hannah saw some things at the Wagner home that she didn't cotton to. First, Jake was extremely controlling. He liked things done a certain way, and he believed that every item had its place. Second, his mother Angela was also extremely controlling and manipulative. Hannah Roden, who was a free spirit, wasn't going to allow anyone to control her, not Jake and certainly not his pushy mother Angela. After Hannah Roden and Jake broke up, they shared custody of their daughter Sophia. Hannah would have Sophia one week and Jake would have her the next. After the breakup, Hannah began seeing another man, Charlie Gilly, who I mentioned earlier, with whom she conceived her second child. And when Hannah and Charlie broke up, Hannah was dating a third guy. By the way, Jake's older brother, George, had been married for a while, but his wife, who also moved in with Billy and Angela Wagner, got tired of her mother-in-law Angela's controlling ways. Angela told George and his wife, that they should only bump uglies to make babies. She also told George's wife that certain acts done with one's mouth were a no-go. I have no comment for that. And each night, Angela would come into George's bedroom, where his young bride was with him in bed, and tell the bride to leave so that she, meaning Angela, could cuddle with George and chat about the day. This happened every single night. Why Angela thought she had the right to control her grown sons and their wives and girlfriends, only Angela knows. Clearly in the Wagner family, Angela wore the pants and the shorts and the snow pants and the jodhpurs, etc. But Angela had endearing qualities as well. She was said to be the type of mom slash wife who cooked all the family's meals. She was also into canning vegetables and making jam. Her house was said to be so clean that you could literally eat off the floor. And when George and Jake were of age to go to school, she insisted on homeschooling them. She didn't want her boys out of her sight, not even for one second. By all accounts, Angela Wagner was like Beaver Cleaver's mother, but on steroids. Now, there was a reason for this obsessive need for control, but I'll get to that in just a little bit. Angela's husband, Billy Wagner, the guy in the tank tops, was best friends with Hannah Roden's father, Chris Roden Sr., and Angela's eldest son, George, was a longtime friend of Hannah Roden's older brother, Frankie Roden. So the Rodens and the Wagners had history, and most of it was good. After Hannah Roden's death, her ex, Jake Wagner, got full custody of Sophia. To the cops, this seemed like a potential motive for the crime. As it turned out, Jake's mother, Angela, 
not only wanted to have full control over her sons, Jake and George, and their wives and their girlfriends, she also wanted to have control over her grandchildren, and she treated them as if she was their mother. And this was easy to do because George lived with his parents with his child, a son named Bolvine, and Jake had Sophia every other week until Hannah's death when he had Sophia all of the time. Now, George and Jake weren't necessarily happy about this, and at one point, Jake had to remind Angela that she's not Sophia's mother, she's her grandmother. So what happened with George is that his wife divorced him, and Angela basically took control of her child, Bolvine. It was a boy. Must be a special name in the holler, because I've never heard that one before, and it reminds me of bovine. Hmm. But I digress. After Hannah Roden's death, Jake and Angela swooped in and took control of Hannah and Jake's two-year-old daughter, Sophia. So now Angela and Jake were completely in control of that child. As the investigators got to know more about the Wagners and about Hannah and Jake's relationship, they began to look at the Wagners as potential suspects. So now I'm going to explain why Angela was so controlling. At least this is why most people think she was like that. It turned out that Angela, as a child, had been a victim of S.A. That experience had deeply wounded her, and this likely caused her to be so protective of her sons and her grandchildren. Before the crime, when Hannah Roden broke up with Jake, Angela began pressing Jake to get full custody of Sophia. Angela, out of the blue, told Jake that Sophia was getting essayed by the Rodens. Angela claimed that every time Sophia came back from a week with her mother, she would appear red in a certain nether region of her body. To Angela, this spelled S.A. Now, there was absolutely no evidence, according to the cops who investigated Angela's claims after the Rodens died. Angela repeated her beliefs that Sophia was being essayed so often that Jake, George, and Billy Wagner began to believe it was true. Jake's family went so far as to draw up custody documents, and they tried to get Hannah Roden to sign Sophia over to them. After that, Hannah Roden posted the following message on her Facebook page, quote, I'll never sign papers ever. They will have to kill me first. End quote. The Wagners were able to see this post because they had hacked into Hannah's Facebook along with her other devices. Four months after typing that message, Hannah Roden would be dead. It was almost as if Hannah had given Jake and his family the idea of what to do to her in order to obtain full custody of her child. Remember those two left shoe prints I mentioned earlier? Well, investigators were able to trace the shoe's sole to a tennis shoe sold exclusively at Walmart. This made it easier to find out if any of the Wagners had purchased such shoes prior to the crime. And there was only one Walmart in Pike County, Ohio as well, which also helped. After the crime in 2017, the Wagners suddenly up and moved to a remote area off the grid in Alaska. They took Jake's daughter, Sophia, with them, as well as George's son, Bullvine. They told their neighbors in Pike County that they feared for their lives, but this had also been a longtime family dream of theirs. For years, the Wagners had said their goal was to move to Alaska, but the Wagners really moved there to escape the scrutiny of the law, allegedly. As they were en route to Alaska, someone from home sent them a photo showing state agents conducting a search of their former home and property in Pike County. Angela would later say in court that she was worried something was going to be found that shouldn't be found. She asked her husband, Billy, is everything going to be okay? And he told her, don't worry, I got all the shell casings, end quote. 
As a family, they decided to concoct an alibi just in case the cops ever questioned them. The plan was to say they had a family movie night and everyone came over. However, Jake would later say he couldn't remember which movie he was supposed to say they watched. Detectives, as you can imagine, viewed this Alaska move by the Wagners as highly suspicious. After the Wagners' home in Pike County sold, the new owner allowed detectives in to thoroughly search the property, and lo and behold, they found a receipt from Walmart on which two pairs of that unique tennis shoe were shown as being purchased. When investigators asked for surveillance video from Walmart, they found Angela on it, and they saw her buying the tennis shoes and walking out to the parking lot. Bingo. Don't they always catch the people because they've just shopped at either Home Depot or Walmart? By the way, Angela also bought a cell phone jammer and a bug detector to check for listening devices. But remember, the Wagners were now somewhere in the remote corners of Alaska. The police, however, found out that the family was coming back to Pike County to retrieve more of their belongings. This is when the cops swooped in. When the family arrived at the border of Montana, the police stopped them, separated them, and interviewed each family member. Angela would later say that she was an emotional wreck and worried that the cops would arrest George and Jake and take away their children, Sophia and Bolvine. Only Angela agreed to speak at this time. And when the cops asked her if she'd recently purchased any tennis shoes from Walmart, she denied it. However, when she was shown the receipt and the video, her memory suddenly improved and she admitted to making the purchase. So she then tells the investigators that she ended up throwing out both pairs of the tennis shoes because they were an old person style and her family members refused to wear them. A likely story. Not. Later, when the Wagners were fully back in Pike County, Ohio, the police cornered Billy in a grocery store parking lot, and he then agreed to speak to them. During the conversation, Billy came across as someone who was open to helping the cops. But when they asked him about the marijuana growing operation, Billy talked about Chris Sr. being the only one involved in it. However, the cops knew that Billy, who drove a truck, was actually Chris Sr.'s partner in this endeavor, so they knew that Billy was lying through his teeth. This made the detectives all the more suspicious of the Wagners. Finally, in November of 2018, the four Wagners were arrested and they were each told they were facing 22 charges for the deaths of the eight rodents. Billy Wagner was tracked down by the FBI in Lexington, Kentucky. He was driving a horse trailer that was pulled over on the side of the road. That's where he was arrested. Billy and his son George both pleaded not guilty, so they both were given the opportunity for trials. And as it turned out, George hadn't actually done in any of the rodents. He was supposed to do in Chris Sr., but apparently he froze when it was time to pull the trigger. So then Billy took over and did the deed. But George had extensively participated in the planning, preparation, and the cover-up of the crime, so he was far from innocent. Now, Angela would later tell the court that George offered to take the fall for the whole family, but the family didn't want George to do this. Angela and her son Jake took a different path than Billy and George. They both confessed to their roles in the crime, and as part of their deals, they had to agree to testify in court against Billy and George. Jake ended up pleading guilty to all eight deaths, although in actuality, he had only been responsible for five of the victims' deaths. I say only, but that's not really a good word. Obviously, this is horrible, 
that he did in five human beings, and his father Billy was responsible for the other three. Jake did this, confessed to all eight crimes, to avoid the death penalty, and when asked why he agreed to plead guilty for all of them, he said he was prompted to do this when he heard his grandmother say that she could not lie about her role in the crime because she knew God was watching. Apparently, the grandmother had written up the fake custody documents that they tried to get Hannah Roden to sign. So all four Wagners were facing the ultimate punishment. Jake made that deal, wherein if he agreed to plead guilty and tell the authorities what happened, the court would spare all of his family members the death penalty. His wish was granted, and although Jake made this deal, the prosecutor told him it was unlikely that he would ever be released from prison, but Jake still went ahead with it. Jake also told the cops where the weapons used in the crime were hidden. He revealed that he cut at least two of the weapons in half with a grinding tool. His brother George helped him do this. Jake then used a torch to melt down the firing pins and serial numbers to prevent them from being traced back to the crimes. He disposed of the ashes in a dumpster. He also burned several items in an old metal feeding trough. The items burned were the clothing and the shoes, those tennis shoes, that they wore on the night of the crime. Cell phones collected from the victims' rooms after they were done in. Shell casings as well. Jake and George dug a hole under a new barn on their land, placed the broken up gun parts into a duffel bag, and buried it under the barn. Jake said he and his father Billy later dug the bag up, removed the gun parts, and put them in a five-gallon bucket, or several five-gallon buckets, filled with concrete, along with Jake's hunting sharp-edged object. I can't say the word because YouTube doesn't like that, but I think you know what I mean. And he had used that sharp object to pry open the locked door on Frankie Roden's trailer. However, the tip of it broke off, so he ended up having to climb through a window to get inside Frankie's trailer. As for those five-gallon buckets, well, they were filled with cement and put into the water as anchors for a goose house that the brothers, Jake and George, gave to their grandfather while he was still alive as a Father's Day present. Their grandfather used it on his lake at Flying W Farm. By the way, Jake also told the cops that his family had committed crimes such as arson and theft for years before doing in the rodents. What a nice family, huh? Jake's mother, Angela Wagner, in exchange for her guilty plea, was able to get some of her charges dropped and to have prosecutors recommend a sentence of 30 years in prison with no chance of early release. So Angela really scored in terms of her plea deal, and she's the only Wagner who has a chance of getting out of prison one day. Angela was quoted as saying this, Even if we weren't arrested, my belief is you never get away with it. You live with it. End quote. Sounds like she had some second thoughts after she was caught. Angela told the court that her family committed the crime to protect Jake's two-year-old daughter, Sophia, from being essayed. Angela said, quote, Nobody's heart was in it. Nobody wanted to do it, end quote. Jake also told the cops where the weapons were hidden. Frederica Wagner, Billy's wealthy mother, was also arrested and charged with obstructing justice and perjury. Angela Wagner's mother as well, Rita Newcomb, was charged with those same crimes. Both women had lied to a grand jury. And Newcomb is the one, as I told you earlier, who forged a custody document 19 days before the crime. The Wagners used this forged document to try and get Hannah Roden to sign over full custody of Sophia. That's when Hannah Roden basically said, over my dead body. 
Now, Frederica Wagner's charges were later dropped, but Newcomb took a plea deal. She's the one who said that she felt she needed to tell the truth because God was watching. At the end of the day, no one really won anything. Eight people were dead. The remaining rodents were forever scared. Three little innocent babies were forced to grow up without at least one parent, and in Sophia's case, without her mom and her dad. And the Wagners ruined their lives as well, all because Angela wanted full control of her grandchildren. Here's how the prosecutors say things went down before and during the commission of the crimes. Now, this is based on what Jake and Angela told them. It was Billy's idea to do in the rodents because of fears that little Sophia was being essayed by someone in the rodent family. Billy decided that all the rodents had to go because if just Hannah was done in, the rodents, especially Chris Sr., would know who committed the crime and they would come for the Wagners. After that decision was made, the Wagners studied the rodents' habits and routines for months, and they learned the layout of all their trailers and their property. The Wagners then purchased ammunition, a magazine clip, and brass catchers to prepare for the crime. Now, I learned something new. I didn't know what brass catchers are, so let me tell you. Brass catchers are devices designed to capture cartridge casings as they are ejected from weapons. The Wagners even constructed a homemade silencer that was used at each crime scene. Billy, George, and Jake Wagner left their home sometime after 10 p.m. on April 21st of 2016, the day of the crime. Angela remained home with her grandchildren, Bullvine and Sophia. Earlier, Billy had arranged a fake drug deal meeting with Chris Roden Sr. at Chris's trailer. So Chris Sr. was awake that night, and he expected to see Billy Wagner show up. What Chris Sr. didn't know was that George and Jake were hidden under his vehicle and holding weapons pointed at him. Chris Roden Sr. had to have been shocked when he found himself getting ambushed by the Wagners. At Chris Sr.'s trailer, George was supposed to do in Chris Sr. That was the plan. However, George froze and couldn't do it. So Jake Wagner took a rifle and from under Chris Roden Sr.'s vehicle took aim and pulled the trigger. At least one shot went through the trailer and struck Chris Sr. Chris Sr. was on the floor when Billy Wagner entered the trailer. Once inside, Billy did in both Chris Sr. and his cousin, Gary Roden. Jake said that when Billy exited the trailer, he was hysterical. Next, Jake George and their father, Billy, went over to crime scene number two, the trailer home where Frankie Roden was sleeping with Hannah Mae Gilly and their six-month-old baby. Three-year-old Brentley Roden was sleeping in the living room. Jake Wagner went in and did in both Frankie and Hannah Mae. Next, the trio headed to Dana Roden's house. There, Jake Wagner did in Dana Roden first with four wounds to her head. Next, he found his ex, Hannah Roden, in bed, propped up and breastfeeding her four-day-old daughter. He struck Hannah in the head twice. She fell off the bed, and he told the jury that he picked her up and placed her back on the bed, positioning her so that she could continue feeding her baby in case it took a while for the bodies to be discovered. As he told the jury this, Jake was very calm and completely without emotion. He also smiled at them at times, which he told the judge was what he does when he's anxious. Jake also did in Hannah's 16-year-old brother, Chris Roden Jr. At the final stop, Billy Wagner did in Chris Sr.'s cousin, Kenneth Roden. Kenneth, as I said earlier, was the eighth and final victim. So Billy did in three people, Chris Roden Sr., Gary Roden, and Kenneth Roden. 
It's interesting to note that it was Jake and Billy Wagner who pulled the trigger on the victims. George avoided that part of the deal and that level of participation, although he was with Jake and Billy that night. And as I said earlier, he did participate in the planning of the crime. Many people wonder what happened to the three children who survived. Frankie Roden's three-year-old son, Brentley, went to live with his mother, Chelsea Robinson. Remember, Brentley was the three-year-old who opened the door to his father's trailer to Bobby Joe Manley on the morning of the crime. Brentley later made a victim impact statement at George Wagner's trial, and he said this to George, I've been scared since that night, knowing bad guys came into my house while I was sleeping. I'm always scared now that I will lose my mommy. You did that to me, end quote. So yes, George Wagner's case has already been tried and he was found guilty. So he's living his life in prison without the possibility of parole. Frankie Roden and Hannah Mae Gillies' six-month-old baby was a boy, Ruger, it's R-U-G-E-R, I think it's Ruger, and he was sleeping between his parents when they died. He's now eight, and he's still part of his mother, Hannah Mae Gillies' family. Hannah Roden's four-day-old baby, Kylie, is now seven and a half years old. It's unclear who's raising her. I'm assuming it may be her father, Charlie Gilly. Hannah Roden's two-year-old daughter, Sophia, the child Hannah had with Jake Wagner and the child that Angela Wagner wanted full custody of turned 10 in November of 2023. After her father was arrested and imprisoned, Sophia was placed in state custody. Her remaining relatives say that she is currently very well taken care of, but it's unclear who's raising her. Sophia lost so much as a result of this crime. George Wagner went to trial in the fall of 2022. He was found guilty, as I said. As for George's son, Bolvine, he went to live with his mother. I told you that, too. It's unclear if Bolvine visits his father, George, in prison. And the father, 52-year-old Billy Wagner, will go on trial on May 6 of 2024. He's facing those 22 charges and life without the possibility of parole. It seems certain that he will be found guilty, just like his son George was. Look at all the lives that were destroyed. And if only Jake and Hannah could have dealt with their custody issues with their baby without Angela's involvement, all of this would have been different. And if she was really concerned about SA, she could have reported it to the authorities and had Sophia checked out. But no, nobody did that. But the Wagners now have the rest of their lives to sit and ponder their mistakes. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories, if you enjoyed this, please do me a favor and smash that like button. I'll see you soon. I hope it'll be sooner rather than later. I'm doing my best, guys. It was a man accused of killing eight people seven years ago is now seven months away from standing trial. Pike County massacre suspect Billy Wagner was back in court today asking for a change of venue in his case. WLWT News 5 Scott Dykes has more from Waverly. Well, Billy Wagner's trial is set to start on May 6. That was one thing attorneys on both sides agreed to in court today. When it comes to Wagner's request to move his trial out of Pike County, both sides are far apart. We need a roadmap for, for a situation like the state of Ohio. That view was shared by one of Billy Wagner's attorneys outside the courthouse in Waverly this afternoon. Inside, another defense attorney argued Wagner's pending murder trial should not be held in Pike County, where the 52-year-old is accused of helping his wife and their two sons kill eight members of the Roden family in 2016.